the delay is interesting because I don't see, like I have Twitch open, but and I follow you, but you're not, uh, you're not like you're not you're not you're not live yet, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Sounds terrible. No. Test, test. Are we back? There we go. No, my mic got rerouted to a different connection because I changed my settings here. Getting up and wandering off. You know what? I'm not going to be able to open... that over here. Let's see how this goes. It's funny, Twitch you have you almost have to use uh Chrome. You know? Mm. Um anything less and it's it's just grouchy. Fantastic. It looks like we got a bunch of folks online and watching. Cool. Welcome, everybody. I need more volume. I need more volume. Guest speaker. Well, let's see how this goes. So I'm pushed all the way. There we go. How's that? It's probably a little bit loud. All right. I think we're about ready to go. Um, welcome back to the stream. Today is January 23rd, 2018. It's really in the early in the morning out on the West Coast. Thank you so much to Glenn Condren. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I didn't realize there was a time this early in the morning that existed. <laughs> it does. It does exist. Yeah. Folks out here. On... <laughs> we get all kinds of stuff done before uh, most people even wake up. My gosh. Um, and today we wanted to talk a little bit about ASP.NET Core 2.1. Some of the cool features. I know you were telling me there's some neat stuff in there, particularly, um, particularly around HTTP Client Factory that you wanted to talk yeah. about and show us. Yeah, we can start. So, uh, yeah, the time before you agree. Yeah, I totally agree. Next time, <laughs> next time I'm going to be right with you. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll figure out if we can do this in the afternoon or something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a project that that I've been working on the Stream Tools project. Mm. Where do you want to jump in? Where Where should well, we start here? What I think we should do is. I think we should write a console application because, as you know, all the best applications are console applications. I, I hear that's how elite developers make their yeah. bones these days. Yeah, like the only reason that we did ASP.NET Core was so that we could be a console application again, of course. <laughs> Everybody wants to be a console application with cool yeah. ASCII art, no less. Yeah. So uh let's do a console application and what we're going to do actually first let's open up a window command window command prompt Fantastic. Uh, on your screen and let's uh let's start typing some stuff let's start let's... typing some stuff let me i'm just gonna scoop down the chat there just a little bit fantastic all awesome. right more coffee for glenn they're saying yes <laughs> all right so i have coffee i may not survive without it so let me um, let me run over here and grab a console window. I have one here that's actually running PowerShell. I'll even mm -hmm. back up a folder here. All right. Where should I jump in? 
All right, so let's run netstat-h in here. Netstat-h. Oh, familiar with the netstat command? Oh, yeah. And uh, it's not letting me run dash h. See what you can run. N, sorry, not h. H is help. N is the command that I was thinking of. To give you just the numbers, just IP addresses and such. It makes it clean. Holy crow, look at all that nonsense. Yeah. So you'll have, this will show you all of the... Um, all the connections you've got running on your machine. Mm. It, look at them all. I know, right? Millions of them. And at least there's, yeah. I, I see some secure ones because we're 443 out there. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can do a uh, dash B, which I think tells you the binary that is causing that connection to be, uh, to be made. Oh, I need elevation. Uh, yes, that's right. For binaries, you need to be admin. Yeah, I forgot about that. All right. So I'm going to right click on command prompt down here. And say run as administrator. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd like an administrator prompt, please. All right. <clears throat> so let's do netstat dash. It was dash n and dash b. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. So there's OBS running. Yeah. Making its connection out to stream the service, I'm assuming. There's yeah. Discord I have running, Firefox. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of OBS connections. Yeah, and then there's a bunch in wait. And so those things that are in time underscore wait, what they are, for any of you who, um, if any of you went to university and did any like networking courses, you may vaguely remember this. Um, they're kind of sitting waiting in case more stuff comes, more data comes over the wire, right? Mm. But they're otherwise done. Now, a connection sits in that state for roughly, I think, two to four minutes before it goes away. Okay. So now so, let's go to our console application. And what I'm going to, what we're going to do is we're going to write a for loop, and we're going to make inside that for loop, we're going to make a new HTTP client, and we're going to make a HTTP request to something. All right. So let me do a .NET new, right? And no. I want to make sure that that's a console application, right? So it's a dash T. I want a console. Mm -hmm. And we'll write this into a, uh, let's call it test console. Yeah. I thought it was dash T for my template. Right? Mm -hmm. Or am I, I'm sorry. No, don't need the dash T. There yeah. There we go. Sorry, there's a slight delay in, in me seeing what you, uh, what you type to what you say cool <laughs> <laughs> so let me roll into test console fantastic program cs all right you were saying let's take a look at this so i'm going to open visual studio code because i like visual studio code mm -hmm. and let's bring that up here cool so in program cs all right all right cool so we want to see. Uh, go ahead and do the C sharp extension while we're waiting. Let's zoom in a little. That's really zoomed in. All right. So right now it's just hello world. Yeah. Cool. All right. So in here, let's do a for loop. Let's say for, um, you know, zero to twenty. All right. Um, make I'll a new that. HTTP request and then do a read line at the end. And, and actually, um, yeah. Right. Do a new HTTP request. Yeah. All right. So I'm just doing a new HTTP request. Var, uh, let's say H. Yeah. Or let's be descriptive. HTTP, well, HTTP client. Do a HTTP client. Make a new HTTP client and do a, and then do HTTP client dot, um, dot send dot get string. Or... Yes, let's do that to begin with, and then we'll... Um... All right, so I've got a new HTTP client. Yeah. And we'll start with console.readline down here. Yeah. All right. And then do client dot, um, you know, dot get, get string async, I think you can do, and give it a, um, give it a URI. Something you can go to the internet and download. Oh, let's go to Bing. We know it's yeah. there. That's right. They can handle an extra 20 requests. Yeah. In the near, in the near future, I think. And uh, I'm not getting any of my type ahead here. 
Did it finish loading the C sharp extension? Mm, it says it's C sharp in the bottom right. Yeah. Hmm. So. All right. Let's see if we can do a build. All right. That. Oh, fingers. Restore completed. Mm hmm. And. Uh. Yeah, we don't have a using statement for that, do we? Isn't it a uh, system.net? Yeah, uh, system.net.http, I believe, HTTP client is it. Cool. Give that a shot. On core, you should share the instance on HTTP client rather than create a new. Yes. <laughs> That's where we're yeah, going. You should, totally, you should totally do that. We should totally do that. All right. Yeah. So let's do that. You want me to run this now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Come on. And then, yeah. And then you'll need another console window, another command window, um, and go and run your net stack command again. All right. So while that's doing its thing, I expect to see it saying that it's doing something here. It's taking its good old time. Uh, you didn't write any output, so it won't say anything until ever. Until it's actually... Well, actually... You yeah. never say anything ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, Console, right line, fetching for the... Uh, let's put a dollar in front of that, right? And then... Uh, there we go. Right, something like that. So now if I .NET run over here, there it goes. Nice. Oh, I don't have the elevated one. Uh, let me go grab that. You don't need dash B, probably. I mean, you can. But if you could just use leave off dash B if you, if you want for now. So there is a ton sitting out here, close it, closed and waiting. Look at those ones. Yeah. So what you should see here is probably at least 20 connections to the same IP address. Oh, yeah. Or, or maybe not the same IP address because, like, it may be different depending on the way the internet works. But you can see a bunch of them there. This 104.64, blah, that's a, that, that, that IP address, for example. Yep. Um, so it's probably Bing. Bing. Well, that's what I got when I pinged, pinged Bing. Mm -hmm. There it is. That's it right there. 13, 107, 21, 200. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So even though my application is done. Well, run it now again. Yeah, you see them all in here. There are your 20-odd connections in here. Now run it again, um, now that you've actually stopped your application. All right. I'm looking for the 13, 107. So they're gone. It yeah. Looks like. Once your app is stopped, yes. All right. So let's run it again and let it wait. Yeah. Uh, not the ping. There we go. Cool. So the application, it's done fetching that data. And yeah, look at them all hanging in here. Yeah. And so and so this goes back to what... Um, this goes back to you feel he's forgotten on a weight. He probably has forgotten on a weight. It doesn't matter too much in this case, um, thankfully. Mm. <laughs> um <laughs> If he was actually trying to write some real logic, then it might cause a lot of problems. Um, so the another the reason, and I, I suspect it's true, and part of the reason for that will be that these are all established instead of done, instead of in like the time wait state. Um, the um, but what we're saying here is that every HTTP client instance you end up newing up, yeah, uh, creates an effectively an OS connection like a socket on the, ser on, the, on the server that you're running on. And so where that causes, where that can cause you pain is um, in this situation where you're making many outgoing requests. Let's say you have one incoming request and then that does like a few outgoing requests, mm. then you can very quickly get into a situation where you're getting so many incoming requests it's and you're making so many outgoing requests that you're just constantly using up and sockets on using up these connections. Using up the connections and the ports. We've only got yeah. so many ports. 
and it takes so long for these to actually go away, like four minutes, that you can run into a situation which you call socket exhaustion, mm. um, which is when you just can't you can't really um, you can't, the server the OS is struggling to keep up with a number of connections that you're demanding. Um, especially if you've got a couple of apps running on a server doing similar things, or you're starting to get a lot of load, um, which is why um, there was somebody told us in chat, Nifix, was it? Yeah, um, there you go. People, the general guidance people have is like, let's share the HTTP client rather than creating a new one each time. So they're saying, just take this line here and move it up. And we'll be in a better place. Yeah. So then, what you'll see is you have one connection to your um, to your uh, you'll have one going to that IP address, and we'll keep reusing it over and over again for the okay. most part. Now, this has some problems of its own. Okay. Um, the big problem you have when doing this is um, what HTTP client how does under the covers is creates this thing, this Win HTTP handler. And what that does is cache DNS entries at the time of that you created it and never really refreshes them. So you end up getting the same IP address every time, even though I'm requesting bing.com and they might have a load balancer that's geo load balancing and sending folks to different IP addresses. I might be getting yeah. the same place when I shouldn't be. Yeah, you may be. I mean, it's probably unlikely for Bing because it's probably pretty stable, but it's, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's that, that, so that's, that's, that's a problem you can run into here. So you fixed your, um, you fixed your, um, yeah, somebody's put a, somebody put a link in a blog post. So, yeah, somebody, um, so you can run into these situations. So effectively, what we're really saying here is you can't really keep it around forever in order to solve this problem of creating a new connection every time but you can't like create a new one every time either mm. so i guess sometimes you create a new one okay it's the answer to that right so you, you end up effectively building your own pooling mechanism for these clients yeah i mean and there are some several people we've talked to that um that have ended up doing that okay so what do we do how do we fix this what's the new What's way that we think sh we should be working with this well do we want to go do you have um 2.1 preview I, one sdk i i think i have the sdk here let's take a look see mm. um so i'm gonna run net version yeah i only say that because then we might be able to just make a new console a new app that uses um that uses uh a new thing that we're building in 2.1 called HTTP Client Factory. So I've got 21100 preview 7326. Is that new enough? Probably. I don't actually remember what their version numbers are. Um, <laughs> when, did you, when did you install it? Oh, gosh. I, we can find that, right? Uh, come on. Where did my folder open at? Um. My wife was just very considerate for some reason, crawled past me to avoid being on camera. <laughs> oh my gosh. And now she's telling me not to tell everybody. <laughs> so don't tell anyone. Don't tell her that I told you all that, okay? Okay. No, shh. Nobody <laughs> say anything. All right. So let me go down into programfiles.net and I'm going to just take a look at, I believe it's SDK, right? And I should be yeah. able to see, right? So here's the new one. And I put that down just today. So it looks like nice. it yeah, brought down a new one for me. Cool. Cool bananas. All right. Yeah, and so there's a couple of things that are coming along that might help this. There's a core FX effort. Um, so Oren and a whole bunch of people have been talking about this for a while. Okay. Um, so core, what core FX are going to try and do, is, uh, what the core FX effort would be, um, we, may end, we'll, we may end up with a, what we've been calling a managed HTTP client handler. Mm. So... Today, what happens is, so if you if you go back to, do you have IntelliSense working now in, uh, in VS? Uh, let's there? try, what are we, what's this complaining about? Oh, look, we've got an update. Now let's yeah. just try closing and restarting and see if we can get it to pop. Because everybody well, loves hello, IntelliSense. Hello, the new people that have arrived. Yes, hey, thank you for reminding me. Uh, good morning, Humble and Tiran. Gosh. And uh, Mazza in the chat room, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, oop, where did it go? 
today we've discovered that there is a time before 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I always thought it was funny how many people at Microsoft don't don't start doing anything with meetings until 10 a.m. West Coast time. <laughs> Um, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's not true in general. Um, our team in particular, um, there we go. I mean, I think it's, I think it's fairly common, but our team in particular starts fairly late and, uh, leaves fairly late. That's why we have things like Fowler standard time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of, I, mean, I guess part of the reason why it started is because Fowler is famous for being up all night. And, and now he's got kids. Things yeah. change. Yeah. It's not true anymore. He's got to drop kids off at school. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh all right let's see if i can get that intellisense yeah that's right Galloway. this is like this is this is this is airport time <laughs> oh i'm i'm set up for for mvp summit i'm flying out at 5 a.m on monday morning i don't oh, know boy. why we do this to ourselves um i've got talk. a i've got a thing with the kids <laughs> uh, uh, to build and debug yes go ahead include those things there we go. Now I've got IntelliSense. Nice. All right. Right. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the constructor of HTTP client, um, if you look at the things that it can accept. So let's take a look at some of the options. So we can take an HTTP message handler and also a bool yeah. to dispose the handler. Oh. Oh, check digits. Shots fired. What is okay. it? Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, oh, oh, and and check digits. I believe you're in the UK, aren't you? So yeah, he's he's a couple hours ahead of us still. Yeah. So this HTTP message handler that you can use here. Yeah. Um, the default one of those, um, the Win HTTP handler. Um, it is the thing that has the behavior that like caches the DNS and such, right? It's not actually HTTP. It's not HTTP clients. The way HTTP client works is it has this, have these handlers. It actually has a chain of handlers potentially. Um, then the last one of which is generally responsible for doing the actual HTTP, like mm. the actual connection. Okay. Um, so the core FX team are working on a managed version of that, that handler, the default handler, um, which will hopefully do something different with DNS, something I hope, a little bit smarter, maybe honor the TTLs and refresh appropriately, something like that. Mm. Um, at a minimum, I, it should be significantly faster than the current one. We've been testing it out for speed a lot, and the perf appears to be really good. Cool. Okay. Um, so we might be able to squeeze a few tens of thousands more outgoing HTTP requests per second. Per second? Just thinking about that for a second. Tens of thousands of requests per second from one service. That's huge, right? Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, 600,000 requests in a minute, right? That's... If if you have a web application that's doing that much traffic, interacting with other services and things, right? Then then you you know you're going to need to start expanding and going over to other servers, scaling horizontally. Mm. Not bad. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's the that we might be able to squeeze some of that out, which would be cool. Um, so the um, so the reason I bring that up is in 2.1, so theoretically you could now do .NET new and get yourself a new 2.1 application, right? Yeah, let's take a look at that. All right, so I'm going to go here. Right, so let's try this out because I've not done this at all. I've been on vacation for a month and then I was sick and then I've not tried to use 2.1 in any way, shape or form. So if I say .NET new, well, let's look at what the console application was that I got, right? Um, yeah. If I take a look at... Test console CS proj. So this is a netcore app 2.0. Mm. All right. So if I go back up, let's do .NET new. Um, another console app? Uh, do a web app. Let's see how we go. All right. So we'll just pull... to see what references and stuff you automatically get. Sure. We can do this in a console app. It's fine. Mostly just interested in what sort of templates we've up with, we've already done, or if any. <laughs> mm. Okay. So now we're going to .NET restore. Restore my packages. I may need to go point to right. Um, I may need to change my. You need uh, to drop a NuGet config. Probably. Yeah, I may need to uh, change my NuGet servers. Let's take a look and see where we're pointed here. Uh, oh, look, Shane, thank you for the follow. And that's. Mm -hmm. I need to move. I need to move Steve over there a little bit. <laughs> He's hiding behind me. Uh, where did it go? Uh, just 
scoot Steve over a little bit. All right. Yeah, another superhuman developer we have here watching you fumble around. I know, right? Hmm? Thanks. No pressure. All right, so let's take uh -huh. a look at the CS Proj. So this is Netcore App 2.0, and it's bringing in the 205. But I'm thinking we probably want a newer version of this, don't we? Mm hmm Okay. So you need to take a look at our NuGet config so we can yeah. add the one of the other servers. Yeah. So, so you want to so, – so if you go to your – yeah, if you go to your NuGet config, go drop a NuGet config and add, a, um, add the ASP.NET Core dev feed. So I can add an I can actually add a NuGet config here, right? Isn't there a template for that? NuGet config. So if I just say .NET new NuGet config, right? It'll add a NuGet config file here for me. There it is. And um, let's open Visual Studio Code here. So I'm just going to go over here, open this folder instead. Uh, test web. Uh, don't save those changes. All right. So now let's open that NuGet config. And now I can I can say clear other packages. Um, yeah, whatever. But we want to grab the... You want NuGet.org? And then I believe on the home repo they have an example of this. So I actually navigated and I brought up the NuGet feeds wiki page here. Um, which one do I want to grab? Not volatile. Do I want to grab CI? No, I'll just grab dev. See how that goes. ASP.NET Core hyphen dev. ASP.NET Core. Let's start dev. with that and then see how we go. All right. So that one, right, that looks like, um, I'm trying to it find has packages out. from seven hours ago. So oh, terrific. Should be, should be hard enough off the presses for you. Yeah. It's all go terribly wrong and nothing will work anyway. So it doesn't really matter <laughs> which one we choose. So I'm going to click the connect to feed. And I should get, there it is. Let me copy that. And so if you go to um, the home repo's um, readme, it actually has a NuGet config sample. Does it? Yeah. To the GitHub, to the ASP.NET slash home. So I'm on ASP.NET home. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. So I could just copy that. Presumably thanks to our glorious leader, Elon. <laughs> make it crystal clear exactly where these things are, right? Mm -hmm. So this is going to pull from first my get on the ASP.NET Core dev, and it's also going to pull in the normal one, the normal public new get. All right. Yeah. Um, go ahead and add those. So now I should be able to go and change my version of things over here, right? Yeah. So let's just do the naive thing to begin with and change ASP.NET Core all to a 2.1 and then see how we go. Because we most we mostly don't really want to focus on this. We mostly want to focus on continuing the discussion we had. <laughs> so let's try doing a build. So it should run the restore first. Yeah, two point one point oh dash star. Is that what you put in there? I just put two point one. Nope. Grouchy. Two point one point oh dash star. All right, save that. I'll let code do the restore this time. There it goes. Now we're getting something. Restore failed. What didn't it like? It's not compatible with Netcore App 2.0. Mm. It needs to be Netcore App 2.1. Mm. So let's change that. And it's not going to do a restore for me automatically. What is it? Uh, what's I forget the command to do the restore packages here in code. Right? The one that's built, the one that, uh, the one the that's one built, that's built in code. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. I remember code commands. Yeah. I'm the same. There is, intelli there is intelligence for them though. Right. If you get to the right thing. If I do this, I'm trying to get the, there's my terminal. Right. So I just did a control tilde to open the terminal. Um, okay, fine. Go away. All right. Let's do yeah. .NET restore here. Am I related? No. No, we're not related. Current .NET SDK does not support targeting .NET Core 2.1. I don't think it's been asked many times either. That may be the first time. What? 
Who's oh. asking this? Yeah. Are are the two of us related? No. Yeah. No. Not at all. Um, all right, so this is telling me that I need a new SDK. Oh, didn't you already have one of those? I thought I had the latest, man. Yeah. What's this one that reporting? Yeah, two one one hundred preview. Yeah. Hmm. Seems like the sort of thing that happens when you try and use previews of things before they actually start get released. running into uh, challenges. Yeah, because I'm not sure what the uh, what the new uh, what the new templates are supposed to. Um... So yeah. here's uh, no, I don't want to. Like... No, I said go stream. Yeah. So is this the right one? Two one four win sixty four. No, presumably not. Um, you would need a you'll need like a nightly of um, the SDK as well. Okay, as so... a nightly of all of our stuff. So you want to go. Um, so you want to go? It's once again it has it in the home readme. Um, it has a link to the to the just above the good NuGet package, the NuGet config that you clicked. There's a link. Obtain a build of the latest .NET Core, Core SDK. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So if you click that, that'll take you to the um, to the to the new um, to the builds of the okay. SDK. Okay. So here's the latest installer for Win Sixty. Just do, yeah. Just, just ignore all that red. I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> That's the way real developers work. Ignore all that yeah. red. Yeah. Nothing sure to see here. <laughs> um, you know, both having beards is not a sign of shared DNA, right? <laughs> Yes, that's right. Mm. You know, because I'm wearing um, a red shirt, that means I'm related to Scott Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Either that or I'm going to have a problem on the away team. See, I'm not sure which of these, um, what version numbers these we need, but let's try the, um, let's try out describing this latest one and giving it a shot. And then if not, we'll do a, we'll do a different thing. Okay. So I grab... sound like a plan. Sounds good to me. So this will be 21300 preview 2. And let's see that install kickoff. Come on now, fella. There it is. 21300 preview. Here we go. All right. <laughs> and then I wasn't offended. Hmm? I wasn't offended. It was a bit of about being, uh, about being, about the prospect of being related. Jeff? No. I named my roomba Jeff. In fact, <laughs> Why, what's what's the thing with naming robots Jeff? I don't get. I don't that. know. I don't know, but he cleans real good. And uh, what did um, Craig Ferguson? It, what his his skeleton? He named it uh, Jeff something. Don't know. Don't know this. The the skeleton army. Uh, I didn't know that. Um, I do know that lots of people named their Roombas. There was some stuff from the CEO of uh, iRobot that said um, everybody named their everybody names their Roombas. And in fact, they had some people refuse to send in their Roombas to get like replaced because they didn't want to lose like Rosie, for example. <laughs> All right. I'm like, no, I can't. I can't replace Rosie. I'll, I'll buy a new one and like leave like, leave Rosie on the shelf. Wow! Wow! I remember an event where there was a movement to name oh to name the .NET bot Fritz. I think uh -huh. I think they were talking about that at MVP Summit last time. Oh, we should we need to give the .NET bot a name, and they wanted to name it Fritz. I'm like, no, that no, don't name it after me. <laughs> or is that is that some way to say oh it's it's broken? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Uh oh. So. Um, so and Fritz, one, Fritz is one of those stereotypical names for someone who's German, is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. So Let's what's this help, help me.net event that we have like a fire bar thing for above above your head? Oh, fantastic. So so we met our goal last week on Saturday. So we're, we're setting up, we're scheduling an ASP.NET Core workshop live here on the stream. Mm. If you'd like to help for half hour, hour, you're welcome to join us. Oh. What are you, what are you workshopping? Just like making a .dot net. We're gonna, .NET we're gonna go. Stuff? Yeah, we're gonna start with the basics. Go from zero to sixty. And we're gonna build a a simple ASP.NET Core application with a little bit of Angular, a little bit of APIs, a little bit of Entity Framework, um, some security baked in. Oh, I shouldn't ask Barry Dorans to help. 
You can ask Barry Dorans to help. You just won't, probably won't be successful. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just a bad idea. Um, Ooh, apparently if Shane made Shane excited. Shane? Um, sure, Shane, if, if you'd like to help, absolutely. Um, but I do, I do have a couple of our colleagues interested in joining. Um, but uh, Glenn, if you want to help, the door's open. Um, all right. So that should have finished installing the, the gist is though, the, the bar you're seeing, we met our last goal. We're setting up for the next goal. So when we get to a thousand followers, I'm going to open up and I'll take calls and anybody who has any kind of .NET question, share your screen and we'll walk through and we'll solve your problems together here on stream. That's the idea. So cool. we'll see how so that you're going to be the You're going to be the help hotline. The help Apple. hotline for a couple hours. Yeah. Okay. See how it goes. Um, so, but <laughs> in the workshop, I'm looking early to mid February. We'll see how we can get that to run. Um, you're going to need a bleep machine handy. If Barry's Twitter is anything to go by. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm going to need a, <laughs> a sensor button. <laughs> so I do, I do prefer to keep things a little bit family friendly. So, uh, mm -hmm. would this be Barry's advice? Everyone delete all your code, unplug from the internet. You're now a secure coder. <laughs> that may well be, yeah. that maybe it will be Barry's advice. I think you might be onto something. All right. So I'm going to run .NET version again over here. There you go. Now I've got the new version two, one, 300 preview. You can't see it behind my head here. All right. See if you can run a restore and then if not, we'll, uh, all right. So we'll I try a backup plan. .NET Before restore we... here. Before we go too far down this uh, rabbit hole, this particular rabbit hole. So I'm trying to... There we go. Got to move it so it's out from behind my fat head. All right. So doing that e expansion of all the... Right, That's this is the local store, right, that it's setting up. Yeah. All right. And come on, packages. No red. No red. Uh, the FCC has the work cut out for them, but I do understand there should be a filter chat option. Yeah. I don't. I don't want anybody to be silenced, but I want to make sure that we're respectful to each other and that we're, um, yeah, keeping thing, things a little bit professional here. It's good to be fun, but. We don't need some of the uh, some of the nonsense there. Unable to find package .NET Core app with version greater than 2.0 preview one. Blah 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 blah. For ASP.NET Core diagnostics. Mm. Right? Yeah, this looks like a package graph build problem. Um, the dependency of uh, oh, we might need .NET actually. We might need the .NET MyGet feed as well. Okay, that's probably what that is. So let's go have a look. Uh, oh, here, the daily feed. Newest SDK binaries. Um, I don't need the SDK binaries, right? We need .NET Core. Well, I'm in... No, this, will, this will be a new NuGet feed. Um, okay. I believe it's the... Um, I believe it's the .NET one as opposed to the ASP.NET. So if I reach down one. into the .NET Core GitHub repository, would they have a link yeah. there for me to the... Oh, here we go. Yeah. Daily preview builds. Uh, yeah. .NET Core Runtime 2.1 Preview. Da, 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 da. I don't need the Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Microsoft.NET Core.app is on the .NET hyphen core feed. I'm surprised it's not on ours. On the other one, maybe it's a... Maybe it's a... Oversight or a problem with dev that I don't know about because I haven't been doing work lately. So these are the these are the builds, but I want the NuGet feed. Oh, I mean core setup. I don't want the setup. Yeah, so just go back to your NuGet.config. All right. Um, add another NuGet feed, and in the um. Add like copy and paste the ASP.NET Core line. Yep, got it. And then switch, change it to um, .NET Core. Dash dev? Yeah, I believe it is. 
All right, we'll give that a shot. I'm going to go back over to my console Me. here because it's our. I can move Animation. this around a little bit easier. No. All right, so now I will .NET restore over here. Make sure I actually have this name right. For some reason, it will not. Mm, unable to load the service index for... Uh, just .NET hyphen core. Ah. <clears throat> Don't need the dev. Let's see if we can get that to go. See, Twitch has this great option. You can put a chat into um, emoji-only mode. <laughs> is Is that like when... You can translate Facebook into pirate. I guess, yeah. Uh -huh. It basically means that, yeah, it, like it's it, it's great. You, know, you can just say whatever you want as long as you can express it using only the emotes available to you. Only emojis. Nice. <laughs> All right. Cool. So I got the restore to work. All right. So jump back into um, – go back to your uh, package graph, to your, to your CS proj. We're going to add a new important package. All right. Which one? Uh, Microsoft – Extensions. Uh, let's see. Extensions. Http. Yeah, Microsoft. Extensions. Http. All right. Which version? Two point one. Same version as the as the old package. There we go. And put the slash. Cool. Dot cool. restore again. Restore again. Yeah. And then let's see if we can still run your app. Jay Mickey, thank you for the follow, and, and good morning, Steve. It's great to see you. All right, that ran. Let's see if we can run it. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't have the HTTP client in it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Oh, the app's not using HTTP client? Yeah, no. Right, this is that, just that web app. All right, specified framework no. was not found. Okay. Shh, everybody. There's a Twitch staff member here. Be quiet. Who? <laughs> what? Shh. Okay. Um, what do you got now? Not framework can be installed. Do framework SDK? Blah 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 blah. Okay. I, hang on. Yeah, I'm Netcore App Two One. Yeah, we're just going to ignore this, and we're going to go and write some code without necessarily running it, so we can continue without without worrying about um, disappearing down this particular thing. Okay. So jump back into some code. Go open up one of your um, pages, and let's see what sort of IntelliSense and stuff you get. So in configure services. Yeah, let's go down here. All right. Yeah. Um. Then. So if I say services. Loading. Yeah. Cool. Right. So you don't have many services in here yet. So what we want to do is um, services.addHttp client is a method you should have now. Yeah. There we go. Look at that. And then uh, now that gives you a type called HTTP client factory that will get shipped in 2.1 as ASP on their core. Mm, okay. Um, and so that's this is the very basic, the very the very bare bones usage of it. We're going to go through a couple of usage patterns. So, yeah, just just call that HTTP client factory. That add HTTP client. That's it. This naming will seem strange for a few minutes until we get to like some of the next usage patterns of it. So, okay, bear with me, or feel free to complain, but just you know. <laughs> um, we'll so if later. you jump, if you jump to then jump into a controller or a page or something else right. that is DI activated. So let's uh, let's create a controllers folder here and I will create a value controller, right? Startup, are we registering? Uh, it's just doing an app run. Um, I don't want app run. I want app dot. Probably want to put a dot CS at the end of your code file name as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> not app run, I want to do you app. Use a, you need to yeah, do services.add MVC. Yeah, so let's do that. Services dot services at MVC. And yep, we got to rename this thing. There we go. Cool. Public uh, class value controller. Fantastic. Let's put it in a namespace. 
uh, what is this? Test web 21. Fantastic. So productive writing code without temp without item group, item templates. I know, right? All right, cool. So this is going to be activated with a um, with dependency injection, so I can actually do that. And so, what should I receive here if I want to grab that HTTP client factory? I HTTP client factory. It's like we planned it that way. Yeah. All right. So let's call it just client factory, and let's store it in a client factory variable uh, property. Am I going to be able to control dot and generate that? Yes. Read only property. Fantastic. Uh, to, to using. Oh man. I th think. All right, we've gotten somewhere. Cool. Why well, want it format? I want to format all. Selection. Uh, hey, well, GB, thanks for following me on Twitter. Look at that. More folks following us on Twitter. Do you do any uh, .NET or ASP.NET development over there? I can't remember what tech stack you guys are built on these days. Okay, yeah, so now you've got a client factory. So if you were to create a um, create a, you know, a route, uh, an action method. Sure. Um, so let's, uh, let's return a string, right? We'll just return values. Who cares, right? Mm -hmm. Get values. Let's return a collection of strings, right? So if we did return new, no, not Booleans, right? Value mm -hmm. one, value two, who cares? I'm returning something. All right, but now I could do client factory. Oh, nice. Cool. Have you been enjoying the experience then? Uh, who is this, 3V? Yeah, sorry, I'm having like a conversation with 3V about what he does at, at Twitch. <laughs> On the side, while you type. Sure, right, yeah. while I'm typing. Yeah. Type uh, faster. <laughs> Um, so clientfactory.create client will get you a HTTP client. Okay. So I don't need to submit anything to that. But I get a client for it. Okay. Yeah. And now I can and do so, I can do get async and all those other cool things. Yeah, you've got a client. And so what we do now is we will take care of disposing of the handler so every time you call create client you get a new http client instance mm. but you do not get a necessarily you may or may not get a new handler okay it it, it may reuse one that it already allocated yes absolutely okay um and so there's a time there's basically a default time frame that we will hold these around for minutes mm. um and so you just every every X minutes a new handler will get created. I think it's based upon the same. I think it's based on the default DNS TTL. Um, so is that something uh, that we can configure? Yeah, it will be something you can configure. I'm not sure what the state of being able to configure it is right now. Okay. Um, so the that'll be that's up to you to configure how long. And we, you have to be able to configure it because what we hope is we hope that with the new managed with the new managed handler. We'll be able to set that time when using that to infinite, because you'll never have to recycle them. Okay. And you only have to recycle them when using the H the Win HTTP handler. Okay, so you get a new HTTP client every time, which means you can mess with this client instance as much as you want. Once you're no longer using it anymore, um, then it'll go away. Eventually, it'll go away. It'll get disposed of. Okay. And then it'll release those ports. It'll release yeah. all those system resources that mm -hmm. we saw were just being j yeah. just hanging on yeah so this is, this is an interesting point 3v um Twi is twitch lib the same thing that you're using um fritz yes yeah so one of the things that one of the reasons i went down this path that i've been going down is i don't know if you were here for the whole thing but earlier on we created a console app and we in a tight loop just nude up http clients and called get over and over again it shouldn't be it and shouldn't one of the things that that does is basically lead you to kind of socket exhaustion on a server because you make new OS like connections over and over again. 
Um, and I believe that if we go look at the code for Twitch Lib, um, the pattern that it uses does that. Effectively, every every uh, every call you make using Twitch Lib makes a new connection on the server. Right. So we were looking at Twitch Lib. Uh, Glenn and I were looking at this the other day. So if I go to Twitch Lib on GitHub, and and this isn't a knock on on the folks that wrote Twitch Lib. It is. It's a Not pretty anyway. It's a pretty yeah. slick um, library here. Okay. But with the new features that are becoming available, this yeah. might be something to to improve. Yeah, it just means that like so if we can and we can look at this like if you go to wherever it is where they're doing web request dot create we could switch your old console app to do web request dot create and see a similar thing happen as what happened before. There it um, is. You just just kind of need to be aware of the the when you're doing when making HTTP calls. It's not uh, as easy as it can seem sometimes. Right. So so even if when you were done with this request, if you did a dispose at the end of this which mm -hmm. I don't see them doing. I mean, you should, they should be, but like, it doesn't matter too much. You would still end up with the same, um, same kind of problems. Okay. Where eventually garbage collector will find it, reclaim it, and then release those resources, but you don't have as much control over it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. 3v in general, the guidance is maintain a single HTTP client and then do things. Um, the problem with that is you could start to get stale DNS entries because the single HTTP client like caches DNS for a long time. Mm. Okay. And so, and so what we're looking at here now is this HTTP client factory, which should just take care of all of that for you. It'll manage your, it'll manage, manage the, the pieces state. of the stack that make that, um, that make those things true. So you don't have that knowledge that you need to have to about managing HTTP clients. So, um, so in, let's in, look at in, yeah. in the in the cases where we're building things like mi that are consuming microservices, we need to go out and do those rest calls from different locations. This is going to be extremely valuable so that you don't exhaust. Yeah, th so those part connections. of the, yeah, the reason that I started to care about this and when we started to to build design and build this was um, because yeah, more and more web applications are making outgoing HTTP as well as incoming HTTP all the time. Okay. Um, so it wouldn't be decided to make it easier to, and so because if it's a short running app process, like if it's a console app or if it's something that starts and stops, none of this stuff really matters for all intents and purposes. Mm. Um, where it becomes important is when you have long running things like a web app, because your process is going to be around forever. You, so it, you, you, you want, want your process to be seven. around forever. Right. And so if your process is going to be around forever, you need to be a little bit more careful about how you manage everything. Okay. And so so in this pattern that we have here, we've just said, okay, I'm going to accept a factory. I'm going to let the factory create a HTTP client for me. Mm -hmm. Let's jump back to the configure services section of this now. So one of the things that you frequently do, um, I know I, I have a, when you're talking to something like the Twitch API or the, um, or like a GitHub API, one of the things that you do, a you can do a bunch, is um, yeah, that's so cool through V. So this uh, should also be clear that the client factory will be a net standard library, so you should be able to use it in any .NET Core application. However, um, it makes a little bit of assumption about the DI being available, so you may need to use like a generic host builder or something to get it running in like a console application. Um, I'm, we'll have some examples and stuff of how to do that, or we'll do it later ourselves, maybe even. So, um, so, so your point about it being available in .NET Standard also answers Skyhoshi's question there about full framework. When this is in .NET Standard, folks using full framework will be able to just consume and use the same API. With the same caveats that you you need probably the web host builder, generic host builder to, to make it happen. Okay. Uh, but we can probably do that later, potentially. Um, okay, so services dot um, add HTTP. So let's let's add a new line underneath services dot add HTTP client. Let's go services dot add HTTP client, and let's give it a string. Give it a name. We're gonna call it Jeff. We're gonna give we're gonna give it a name. Yeah. What do you mean? So I'm adding HTTP client, and then inside here, give it a string. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so we'll name it Jeff. Yeah. Fine. I didn't know we could give it a name. Look, at, hang on. Yeah. You treat you can treat your HTTP clients like pets now. It's great. Okay, Wait, so why would we want <laughs> after the after you've given it a name of Jeff? Yeah, there's you can also accept a um, configuration, uh, a, a, a func. So then, just after this, okay. go C. Just go C goes to, um, you know, open curly brace, close curly brace. 
Ooh, inside look at that. there. Yeah. Base address. And so this is an action of HTTP client. So what happened? What this what this function here is is every time you call create client, the mm -hmm. client we basically you basically get a brand new HTTP client that may or may may not reuse a handler, and then it'll run this func to allow you to configure the HTTP client with some default configuration all the time. So default request headers. I can put like au default authorization headers, default, um, right? This is my application ID in the header. I can set yeah. that up right here. Yeah. Yeah. So like if you want to, for example, talking to GitHub, you usually have like a base address, so api.github.com. You probably have an accept header to get the latest like version. And you probably have, and I think GitHub mandates a user agent. So you've probably got to set a user agent for every HTTP client that wants to talk to GitHub. Okay. So you could put all three of those settings in here. Mm. Right. What was it? Uh, default request headers. And then I can start adding to that. There's a name and then the values that I wanted to add. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. And so uh, base address is a URI, so you need to do base address equals new URI. Oh. And then um, and then if we, once you've done like your configurizing, then, sure, you can, start with that. then you can jump back over to where you were consuming this code. Okay. So now um, I'm just doing client factory. How do I make sure that I get so the Jeff when you client go, factory? When you go back to values controller, when you do create client, you can give it a string as well. So you can ask for Jeff. So there's the URI. Uh, oops. Hang on. So it doesn't look like in the signature it's showing me here that I can specify not, that. Not doing get async there. Yeah. So pass it, Jeff. In the create client. Yeah. Okay. It looks like it's accepting that. Okay. So even though I'm passing HTTP Bing here, it's still going to go out to Bing. But if instead I selected slash, and I forget what the APIs are, but if I went to slash issues or something against yeah. what was my base API that I configured, base URI over here. Yes, then this, this would work. Yeah. It would bolt that on to that GitHub. Yep, totally. Cool. And then, okay. if, you, and if, then if you did create without the name, you would get the default one again that didn't have any configuration. Okay. Because you call add HTTP client twice. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so let's continue down this and journey would, of discovery. It would, it would maintain mm -hmm. those as two separate pools of clients? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you would get two effect, conceptually you would effectively end up with kind of two. If you use those HTTP clients a lot, you probably have constantly two connections on the server, potentially. Mm. Okay. Not um, terrible. Yeah. So uh, now um, let's continue on this journey. So we have some stringly typed... Um, now we have some stringly typed clients. Basically, that's what this is. You've got to give them a name, which is a string. So you need to copy the name around everywhere, right? Yeah. So that's you know kind of nice, but there's I mean, some I other things that, we can do as well. I could put that name into a constant and hide it somewhere, so it's a little bit yeah. more strongly typed. Does anybody in chat like strongly object to this? To these strings being floating around in their application? Could we could we do something like create an extension method? Call it create Jeff client that automatically fills that in. So if you use I HTTP client factory, you could not share the instance, the instance of what the HTTP client, uh, the... you can, you just don't have to. And you don't want to hold on to it for a long time because that'll just interfere with the factory being able to recycle to being able to dispose of its handlers. Uh, Galloway thinks we need to put these in ResX files so we can change it from Jeff to Jose. Who does, who does Galloway work for now? Can we... Can we ping that guy? Can, can we ask him to like intercede in his, intercede. In his behalf? Change this to, to Juan. Change this to Pedro. Julio. Galloway, you're in, you're in for a lot of HTTP Client Factory today because I'm pretty sure you're going to see more of this in the community stand-up today. John Galloway has logged off. Oh, good. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Galloway works for Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Look at we're we're being invaded now. Look at this. Yeah, it'll it'll create a new it'll create a new instance of HTTP client, but it may reuse the instance of the handler, which is the thing that's actually expensive and dangerous to create and dispose of. So the HTTP client itself doesn't matter. So so to draw a comparison to something that we're already familiar with, like how we do async await, you maybe go onto a background thread. You might not. 
you don't really care. Same thing yeah. here. You might be idea. on a new client. You might not. Yeah. Don't really worry about it. We'll manage that for you. And it means you get to like mess with stuff on HTTP client after you call create without worrying about it and messing anybody else up. Okay. I, I'm agreeing with Isaac here. The number of lurking MS employees is very high on this stream today. <laughs> yeah. You could start. You could start just. Um, you just. You just start insulting various products and see who complains. We'll see who's who. Who's here that works on the various things? I guess. Sure. Right. I, I think there's a couple folks that are looking for us to use live share. I don't know if you were able to get finish getting the. Uh, uh, yeah. So DJ Vortex, I believe that is true. Yes, that they have their own uh, handlers and they will never share one. The theoretically they could. So I'm not going to like. Like, like it's possible that they could, but I don't believe that. You know, I believe that in our current implementation, they do not ever. All right. Okay, so. Let's do something. How about we do what uh, we actually had in mind then for um, typed clients instead of uh, ResX files, Galloway. <laughs> so how do I type this then? So if you, I'm going to go grab um, some more water. What you're going to do whilst I am uh, away is make a new class. And that class is going to represent your, effectively your service. So you might call it like GitHub service or GitHub client or something. Okay. And then you are going to accept in the constructor of that type a HTTP client. And Ben Adams is on point today. Ben Adams is here? Oh my gosh, Ben Adams is here. I mean, he's on point every day, but in particular today. He's here. Where he's, where he's predicted my next trick. Oh my gosh. All right. So I'm creating this new client. And we're going to create a constructor here. And I shall be back momentarily. All right. What am I receiving? <gasps> I HTTP client factory. I'm going to wait for Glenn to get back before I get too confused here. Um, but thank you everybody for, for joining here today. Um, yeah, look, Ben popped into, into the stream. Uh, Stone Waffle, thank you for joining us. Thanks for, for the follow. And uh, Mark forty three twenty three, thank you for the follow and and good morning, St good morning, Steve. It's great to see you on the stream. Dave, he's Steve's not sweating quite like he did on Saturday morning. So, um, for those of you that 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 were here Saturday that that know where we've been, uh, Stacyson, Stacyson, yeah, all right, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, I had a previous goal that you see the goal up at the top. Uh, the, We've, we've changed goals, but our previous goal was for a ASP.NET Core workshop. We hit 500 followers combined between Twitch and Mixer. We're going to host an ASP.NET Core stream here, workshop stream here live. We're, gonna, we're scheduling that for February, and I've got a couple folks that are really interested in joining us. So once we get that locked down, we'll, uh, I'll send out the invite to everybody. But the new goal that we're looking at here is this helpme.net event where we'll almost have a call-in show and... Uh, I'll help you fix and solve some of your questions. Lichen, 1534. That's it. That's a Wear developer. That's what that is. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, look at that. And a follow now from Ben. Thank you, Ben. I appreciate that. Why, thanks, Stone Waffle. I'm glad you enjoy it. All right. So I have my client class here. Now, what do you want me to do with this? I want you to accept the HTTP client in here. An I in HTTP the client or just an HTTP? No, just, just a HTTP client. Okay. Just a regular old HTTP client. Uh, we've got to put our using statement on there. Mm -hmm. And put this somewhere. Stash it away. Yeah, put it on like a property or something. All right. And let's save that off. Uh, there we go. Okay. So cool. Now go put that into startup. Yeah. Make so you probably I guess make this list to begin with. Let's make HTTP client public. Mm, okay. And I'd probably want to rename this then from underscore client to just client. Well, you could leave it, but you would be a terrible person. I would be a terrible person, and Alan would never forgive me. All right. So should I register this? Uh, yeah, so now I'll go back into uh, configure services. Fantastic. All right. 
and then in configure services, um, you can add HTTP client of T. HTTP client of T? Yeah. So call it the GitHub client? Add HTTP client. Yep. Angle bracket. GitHub, GitHub client. Close angle bracket. Ooh. All right. What am I and then... And then you can accept a GitHub client in your app code. So if I go over, I'm going to go back to my value controller, and instead of accepting a client factory, the popsicle there is a special place in hell reserved. Oh no! For mutineers and people who use Hungarian notation. <laughs> so now, uh, oops, oops, receive that. So now I could do this, underscore client, equals client. And now my client's actually being managed, the state, the uh, uh, life cycle of it's being managed by the uh, dependency. It, uh, I'm sorry, the container. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. So now instead of saying client factory, so, client, create client. Yeah. It's transient, effectively. Every time you ask for one, you'll get one. So now I could just do underscore client. Now, in this case, you haven't put any methods on on your type, so you've just got underscore client dot client, effectively. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I could wrap some of these. Yeah, right? you totally could. You could make a method now which encapsulates calling whatever API you want, right? Right. So if I, uh, so, I could do I enumerable of int get issues, right, and I did something here, whatever it is, to go get that stuff. And uh, return new, right? And then whatever they are that come back from GitHub. Uh, I need my yeah. using statement. And then that's doing whatever fetch from over there instead of me having to go do this. Yeah. This is kind of the end game of HTTP client factory, right? This is where we think, this is where we hope everybody goes because the, they like it and it's just better. Right, so so I've pushed everything out into an external external class. I could put it in an external library. Yeah. Now you can also go write a unit test for this controller and just mock get issues. Mm. Okay. So right, you, can, completely... you can you can pass in a mock get a mock get client. Right. Sure, and then I've, I'm able to to actually test that this is formatting and handling things properly as it's being passed back out. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, you can test your test your controller, and so um, now then you could also, for example, you could continue to use the configure func, but you're probably more likely in the constructor of your GitHub client put uh, um, put your um, put that same like GitHub configuration code that you had before, right? Sure, sure. Now I did this add HTTP client, and I'm specifying my client here. If I wanted the Jeff one to go in there. Can I do well? This? this is this is this is a distinct add HTTP client. So you would instead move oh, that code into one. this one. Yeah. So gotcha. you would need instead move that to here. So this is yeah. So I would no no. So instead, the name of this. So the, conceptually, what you've done is replace your string Jeff with the type GitHub client. Gotcha. You no longer need. You don't. You no longer ever use that string Jeff, right? Because strings are terrible. Strings are evil. So I could get rid of that, and I yeah. just got now, this feature. Yeah. Now, if you see if you can remove the string, um, um, see if you can remove the string and the comma. Yeah. And now, now you're more in a world that makes sense, right? Sure. So I'm I'm still I, I'm still needing to register my HTTP client here in order to yep. to kick things off, but I can have this thing actually live somewhere else. Uh, what was this thing? Sorry, I, I can actually have my GitHub client concept live, have that live out in another library. Yeah, okay. potentially, I guess, um, if you really if you wanted to do that, yeah. So what I'm thinking is, how can I how can I simplify and get rid of as much of this as possible, so that I'm down to well, the next thing you could do is instead of setting base address here, you could set it in the constructor of the GitHub client type. Mm. And so as you, all you're doing is saying add this type, and that's it. So go back over to this. That would that would remove more code from here if that's your goal. Absolutely. 
right? If I'm providing a library that says, here's, here's how you should interact with GitHub, right? If I'm thinking of the OctoKit, uh, Octo, yeah, OctoKit library, mm -hmm. right? I want to put all the stuff to, for how to configure, how I want to communicate with the GitHub API into this class so that inside your startup, you're configuring as little as possible. Yeah, I mean, I hadn't really been, hadn't really thought of it as a, as, as a way to ship. I, I personally hadn't been thinking of it as a way to ship like a typed client that somebody else could then just consume. But yeah, I guess it would work. Okay. Um, right, and I, I guess I would even want to do, right, write my own extension method so that I could say just services add GitHub client. Which, which and then we, it under the covers would call that. Hey, would call client. this. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay, so now let's uh, let's jump onto something else. After add HTTP client, can you do dot? There's a fluent property here. Ooh, okay. So is this the same? So now we're actually getting into the reason why I created, like why I wanted us to create this HTTP client factory in the first place. Mm. Had nothing really to do with managing HTTP client lifetimes. That was a pleasant side effect for me, not for everybody that was involved. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's my name. That was where we were calling it Jeff before. Yeah. So see here how it has, says add a HTTP message handler. Mm. Okay. Yeah. What do we so, get on that? So you can add a um, you can add there a message a handler. What this is is effectively outgoing middleware. For our for HTTP client. Oh, that's too cool. All right, why am I not getting? So, oh, <clears throat> right, because I'm not returning anything yet. Right. So if we go make a new type, make another new type. Yeah, make a new client, make a new type. Let's make our let's make a new handler. So I'm, I'm going to go just in my controllers uh, folder here, just because that's easy. All right, what should I call this one? Um, call it uh, retry handler. And so for those of you who are going to like spend, do be, have today be like all.net all day, um, Ryan Nowak, who is the, the main dev who built all this stuff, um, made my prototypes not shitty and, um, and otherwise architected and made it great, um, will be on the community stand up today talking about this stuff. And he will have um, presumably a whole bunch of different demos and a whole bunch of different ways of explaining things. All right, so I have a retry handler class. Should I inherit from something over here? Yeah, delegating handler. Delegating handler? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, so I stole a little bit of Ryan's thunder today by doing this, but I needed to because after we saw what was happening in your Twitch library and wanting to think about outgoing HTTP a bunch in your code base, I thought this was worth, this is a worthwhile tangent. Okay. So, so I have a retry handler here. Mm-hmm. And this will this will be middleware for the outgoing requests. Yeah, that's what it'll be. Okay, uh, uh, you've got my interest here. What do I? What do we? What should we do with this? Protected override task HTTP response message send async is the method that you want. Oh, poor Shane. <laughs> what did he do? Uh, Watch the community was, stand up. Yeah, he was trying to link to the community stand up. Sorry. Uh, protected override and what am I overriding? Uh, it's a, it, it takes a type of type. It's a, it returns a task of HTTP response message, and it's a send async is the method name. Send async. You don't appear to have. Well, I don't. I need to control dot in everything. Yeah. Cool. Uh, it, it accepts a HTTP request message and and a cancellation token. Yeah, whatever. You didn't even want to help anyway, did you, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it's the cancellation token. Come here, you. Yep. All right. Cool. Man, that's long. Come here. Now, why doesn't it like that? Why am I getting a red underline here? Uh, okay. Says it doesn't like send async? No, not all code paths return a value. Oh, yeah, of course I don't. You haven't written anything in here. Exactly. Um, so return base.send async and give it message and cancellation token. Base.send async message cancellation token. There we go. 
Let's rename that. Um, what Shane was trying to link to, by the way, was live.asp.net, the URI. Come to, to Mixer if you want to post links. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Mixer do, doesn't uh, doesn't have Nightbot running over there. So I, I'm not able to, to keep things as censored. So um, I just rely on Chris to help out with that. I don't know if that's good or bad. Oh, it's very good. Chris is great. No, I mean, not being able to have Nightbot. Seems better to have Nightbot. Okay, so, so, so actually, yeah, now what, you're returning something, right? <clears throat> yes. If your, like, anything. indentation and your cabracing stuff is, like, driving me crazy, dude. Oh, come on now. Now you're going to tell me tabs and spaces. Can we not, like, put, you know, put, put an enter at the end of this and put the curly brace on a new line, for the love of God? That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, it gives enough space here, a little breathing room between our code. Makes it uh, easier to read, man. <laughs> apply, oh, <laughs> apply for oh, a show with Twitch. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you can bust right through the... Uh... Damn. Wow. Okay. I like it. Well done. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. Okay. All right. So we're, we're not doing anything here yet. But I should be able to register this now, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you should be able to. All right, so I'm going to go back over to startup. So add HTTP message handler, and I should be able to reference that. Right? What were we calling it? Let me get rid of uh, some of these other ones. A retry handler. Yeah, retry handler. Now, can I do that as a type? Uh, I'm just trying to remember. I don't remember what the API looks like. I suspect it's a generic. Yeah, there we go. Hmm. Look at that. So now, if we were to run this, um, what this handler would do, if you go back and look at your handler, um, in the in the retry handler, this will the code the a request will go through the retry handler logic before it goes to the actual handler that's going to execute the request. In this case, when you say base dot send async, you're saying okay, go do the request, try the request. Okay. Right. So now you could wrap, for example. You know, a for loop here, do a try, catch your HTTP request exception, and then just keep retrying until um, f for some number of counts, and then and then th and then th and then bubble, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, oops, deleted too many lines. Can't help himself with these braces. I don't know, guys. What? What's the matter with the braces? Come on now. <laughs> All right, so I should I should actually capture this so that I'm not doing a return in the middle of a try block. Why not? You can do that. Right. You could totally do that if you want. And then even then, I'm going to run into running a four here, and I don't want to declare it in the middle of it. Right. Uh, um. So it depends. There are several ways you can implement this. We can implement it the way that Ryan does it in our sample repo with some funky new C sharp features, if you like. Uh, let's return an HTTP. Uh, I want a response message. Out message. Right. I know. Like, what is this? Out message equals that. And I'm going to need to do an await. Are, are there options in the retry handlers? I'm not actually sure, Shane. That's a pretty good question. I suspect it, that given... It, it depends on how we instantiate them. So as long as we use DI to create them, then the answer would be yes. I'm not actually sure if it's uh, if it's uh, if the answer to that is true or not. Should be a question you should ask uh, Ryan, or wait until after I go look and find out. Have some fun. Ask uh, ask Scott and Damien that later. <laughs> stump them. <laughs> well, uh, Ryan will be there, so there'll be no stumping of anybody. There'll be no no questions about this that stumps Ryan. <clears throat> So I could do my for loop here, right? You could, I guess. Right. For int i equals zero, i less than, retry it five times, right? Ah! So what you can do as well is you can put the for loop outside the try, and then you can say for of uh, i equals zero, i less than retry count i plus plus, and then do a catch when i equals equals retry count minus one. 
retry count, and then we store the retry count somewhere. Mm -hmm. Put that down there. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that one. And, and then, so do catch. Hang on. Let's see now. If all these braces were on new lines, this would be so much better. Yes. <sighs> there you. Go. There you go. Need some more spacing. He's not going to do it though now, Chad. Just to just to piss me off. No, I did it. There you go. I'll put it on new <laughs> line for you. Okay. Um, so now you can return here. You can return a wait, but uh, you can just return based on send async. In fact, you don't 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 await it in this in this instance. Just return um, it if it works. Yeah, um, and then catch. But isn't HTTP that a violation? Doing exception. that return in the middle of when and now after the catch after this first catch here, do when. Oh, you want to do a when over here? When I. Um, so yeah, so when so do when space round bracket i equals equals retry count minus one. Yeah. Oh, I know. It was <laughs> it was killing me, killing me softly <laughs> and slowly. Um and this you can remove this catch onto a new line too, Jesus. Oh <laughs> I can tell you. Oh wait, wait, hang on. Hang on. Uh, so yeah, before we there ship, poly will be built in. It'll be in the box, and you'll just be able to say use poly retry, and it'll use the poly retry policies. What we're doing here is rolling a poor man's poly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now I'm yeah. still getting not all copads because I'm not returning up here. I'm not returning. Right, anything. and so in here, just throw because what we're saying is here once you've hit the retry count bubble, yeah. right? Bubble the exception, and then do another catch of HTTP request exception where we like you know wait for a millisecond or something if you want to do that, but otherwise you know, you just keep you just keep trying really really quickly. Does that make sense? And then and then you should be good. Hang on, new line. There we go. Right, and then I would do a uh, right task. Delay. Stop talking about Mr. Gunlock. <laughs> so we try again. What are we saying here? What's Mr. Gunlock saying? I also put bra braces like I'm paid per line. <laughs> so are there no code styles? So I'm not. I'm surprised that the uh, there are lots of code styles in MS. Jeff just doesn't follow any of them. I'm sorry. <laughs> he wasn't even consistently the one true bracing style. Like it was, it was bizarre. Sometimes well, he put braces at the end of the line. Sometimes well, I was he didn't. expecting like, it to reformat for me. <laughs> it didn't reformat for me automatically. I'm like, yeah. Vi Visual Studio 2017 does that, you know? <laughs> yeah, so something like this effectively would be saying, like, so send, call send, catch a HTTP request exception, and like, so on and so forth. And then, so if, if we do completely fall out of here, mm. right, we still need to return something yeah right so how do well, we return can, an empty uh you'll never you'll never actually hit that so you could just throw at the end outside of the for loop but um but yeah the um you can you and you can rewrite this in several several dozen different ways i was mostly just playing around with some new new features in the way that i described that to you um and yeah the rewrite this this so this would uh would retry what five times did you say Yep. Right, retry yes. count five. That is true. That is one of the things that, that hits, hits people through V. So there's no option. It's it's a it's a benefit, I think, for the most part. Um, I although I constantly uh, get annoyed by things like mandatory um, mandatory uh, the the way the way that it enforces the uh, namespace like includes stuff like that. That kept getting me as when I first started. Define poly and how will it become available to the masses someday? Okay, so it's available. Poly is available to the masses today. Um, it's an open source .NET library. Um, yeah, sponsored Shane by the just, .NET Foundation. Shane just did a big uh, a spurb a burb about it. Um, and so what you what you would expect it to look like is um, you'll be able to do like add HTTP client um, of my GitHub client, add poly retry policy or something like that and then it'll automatically use the poly library to do the retrying for you um, you could also add circuit breakers and so circuit breakers are interesting in this case um, where 
uh, you start to fail fast if a given HTTP, if a given endpoint has started to fail. So instead of continuously overloading it with more requests, Polly will start throwing from within your app once a certain number of uh, failures have happened. Right. Short um, circuit, fail quickly, and move on, handle it, right. take appropriate so, steps. So in a sample app that I have started, that I started to write for HTTP Client Factory, um, I have a, effectively your GitHub client here, that okay. type. It yep. accepts a memory cache as well as a HTTP client, and I add oh. memory cache to services. And then it keeps track of the last known good, and then it catches a poly circuit breaker exception, and whenever it hits one of those circuit breaker exceptions, it just returns whatever the last known good is from memory cache. And so then you end up in this situation where having the backend API, whatever it is, go down doesn't kill you because as long as you've been able to talk to it at least once, you've still got something cached in memory. Okay. So, and then uh -huh. you can return, you know, here was the data as of this time, even yeah, though that's it's right. cached. And you need to build your whole kind of app around these concepts if you really want circuit breakers to work appropriately because you need to netflix is pretty good at this right um i don't okay. know if you've ever had this happen but occasionally netflix will just like freak out and start giving you weird recommendations or really old images or something like that right no never oh yes yes <laughs> Um, doesn't it doesn't happen all the time, but I've seen it happen, and I've certainly read about it happening a bunch in their tech blogs. I've, um, and typically, what that means is that something has broken, but I everything it, keeps working. I thought it was just my daughters were watching My Little Pony using my profile. On that's a different problem, and we know that it's not them watching My Little Pony. Oh, it is. Huh? Huh. All right. Um, but yeah, so so you could so if you try to architect, you could try and architect your app such that um, when you get these circuit breaker exceptions, you return some cache data or some something, um, or you do something appropriate to say like this thing is not available. Maybe you retry later, and you okay. may that may not be possible. May like given the thing of your app, it actually really you really do kind of need to think about like you need to kind of think deeply about um, handling failures throughout your whole app in order for it to really make sense for the most part. But sure. um, if there's one thing that we've learned on the internet, it's that you can't rely on the network connection being there 100% of the time. You can't rely on other services being there 100% of the time. Even yeah. though they might have five nines reliability, there's still, what, five minutes a year that they won't yeah. be there. Yeah, and so, um, so circuit breakers mean they basically, once you've gotten a couple of failures from a particular endpoint, um, it'll snap, it'll open which will mean that um, it'll just start instantly throwing a circuit breaker open exception and in, instead of um, instead of trying to do the request. Um, there's a good there was a good book based upon Java where they talked where the where the circuit breaker pattern was first defined, where um, one of the things that can happen in distributed systems is something starts to go down or it starts to go slow, and other things keep hammering it over and over again, which just make it worse until eventually you have this cascading failure where because one service went down, everything went down. Uh, and in the example I think that was given in that book, um, it brought down an airline um, ticketing system. Mm. Oh so that gosh. there was nobody, so the it was the kiosks that you could use to get tickets, those little okay. kiosk things in the airport. Sure. Um, and the airport airline didn't have enough staff to process, they no longer hire, they no longer have enough people like come to the airport because mm. those computers take so much load off the off the people, right? Sure. And so it caused like it was a disaster, like a <laughs> like it was a massive disaster. This this thing, and um and part of the things that would have mitigated it, would have made it better, was that if you know appropriate bulkheads and circuit breakers were built in, such that that thing going down didn't bring everything else down. Okay. Um, so this is why Cesar de la Torre will say things like you know don't use HTTP to communicate between services in your back end when, when building microservices um, because you end up with these long chains of HTTP connections which all could be failures. So he tries to tell people to do things like put every, use a message, use a message bus for everything, put a message on a message, on a, on a thing, on a queue. And, then, Absolutely. And, then away, and, then, and then do things like that, right? The, those uh, fire and forget types of operations that you yeah. can live with a delay on. Yeah, but I mean, that's it's complicated as well, right? <laughs> so it can it can be uh, sometimes it can that can be hard and if you, and that doesn't help you at all when you're trying to like pull data from GitHub or pull data from Twitch or something like that right sure sure but you know what you can you you could fail fast and you know what extend your delay maybe you know instead yeah. of delaying 
a so the example a, a second the, you know what let's yeah. delay two seconds if we're still having a problem all right let's try again in five seconds yeah like exp exponential back off exactly. um, stuff yeah which is part of probably probably so i would not surprise me if that was built into one of Polly's options um so the um the one of the examples i like to give is you could have a form um you can have a website that is running mm -hmm. and the one of the services that collects data if you split your backend up enough one of the services to be able to click submit might be down but everything else is running and so you could you want to ideally have your entire site keep working but when you've gotten a circuit breaker exception for the service for the form you want to show you instead return an error and that page becomes read only or something or that form the form submit button says sorry there's we're having a problem some difficulty right now try again later right so you effectively preemptively stop users from trying to click the button that's not going to work so uh you could run into this where if uh, right simple example running a storefront you want people yeah. to be able to continue shopping, looking at the things you have available, but when they click submit, maybe your credit card check system is down. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. put it in a queue and say, hey, thanks for yeah. thanks for your order. So, we'll charge your credit card in a few minutes and, we get and let you know. Yeah. So for that type of thing, yeah, that's that's perfect, right? You accept the order. Then if but if your but if your thing that can accept the orders is down, um, then you have to then change your UI again in a different way. Right, right. And, the, and chances are when you build, you end up building all of this technology to handle all these cases and most people never see it because they're usually fairly transient errors. Let's yeah. see here. Uh, suggestion, you can remove the I less than retry count yeah. from the for loop. Yeah, you can. Um, sure. It was just, I, was, I was mostly just making him use like weird features to see if he understood. <laughs> So if I got rid of this, I could actually do um, while true, right? Uh, no, you want to pump the, you want to pump the, the, the. Oh, so sure, because you never actually, because you want I to increment, but you're never actually going to, um, you're never actually going to exit the for loop. Yeah. Right. Not super worried about it because you should no one should ever have to write this because it'll be done for you with Polly in a far better way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we talked to the guys that work on Poly um, and told them that we were going to do this. They were they were super supportive. Cool. We should end up with something cool, um, and it'll be something along the lines of like add Poly. It'll be something you could imagine. Like if you go back to your registration, we don't know exactly what this would look like yet, but with a couple of the prototypes that I built early on before we actually started working on this, um, you could do things. You could do something in here like a dot add Poly. And then mm. have a poly funk, and in there you could say poly dot add, and you can build up the build up the policy to be using Polly's APIs. Like it is Polly. We're not going to try. You're not trying. You don't try and hide you, Polly. You've delegated effectively to that library. Here you go. Yeah. Apply your configuration. Exactly, and then and then you end up building this poly policy, and then then you have we have a built in uh, effectively retry handler, and all it does is catch have have the poly policy and like execute through it or something like that. Right. right. So you're just passing in configuration and you're good. Yeah. Um, you could definitely do it here, somewhere here in, uh, in message handler. Um, yeah. Um, sure. Nifix. The question is, the one thing I'm not sure, what I suspect is true, <coughs> what I suspect to be the case is that you would be able to use options in your retry handler um, because we activated via DI, in which case you could probably use options in there, but I don't know the answer to that for sure. So we could define another class here, public class, retry, handler options, right? And then uh, public int uh, retry count. Pull that from somewhere. And if we register it, um, New retry options. There we go. Retry count equals five. Then we could go back to our handler, add a constructor. Ah, come on. Retry handler options, options. And we could say this dot options equals options create that thing and then here I could say options 
retry cap. And now it's completely DI and it's sitting out somewhere else. You know, cool. Absolutely very doable. So, all right. That's pretty cool stuff. And it, it certainly would help, you know, it, it, particularly around that Twitch lib to, to minimize the amount of requests that we see going out. And you saw in my net stat the number of requests that were going out to Twitch to get just some of the numbers that I have up there up at the top um, embedded in the video here. So you can, there is an overload of ad HTTP message handler that accepts a funk of delegating handler. Uh, that is a funk of delegating handler to, you could return a new, return a delegating handler inside that funk, for example. Um, there's also one that accepts an iService service provider and a delegating handler. Ooh, okay. Um, so I could get rid of the generic type. And then I believe that the um, the then I believe under the covers the ad HTTP message handlers are using options to 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 stitch together this chain, mm. um, which means there should be some interesting patterns you can do in here too. Okay, so what's the funk type here? This is um, mm. I service provider and returning a delegating handler. Uh, there's one that is just funk of delegating handler, and there's one that is funk of I service provider delegating handler. Okay, so there's two different ones, two different overloads. So, so yeah, here you could just return a new retry policy, retry handler, right? Uh, new retry handler and and set the retry value directly here. Yeah, that was the intent, Shane. Um, the reason this came about is because Hunter gave me that charter of like, make, make that exact type of scenario better. And this is the thing that we landed on. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and then, so, so, an so interesting... the other thing, the other thing you could think about Shane would be like, say you're going to use console IO to do service discovery and you're doing client based service discovery instead of DNS. You could imagine an, a message handler here that takes the URI, resolves it against some external service and then continues and then changes it such that you can plug in console or, um, some other like remote service that does service discovery for you if you wanted to do that. Um, in the case of, there's a couple of people that I've talked to that do that, that type of stuff already. And in, in fact, in that same way, um, they don't want the latency of DNS updates. So they like do that and cache it heavily on, in the app itself. Um, the code for hand king, what's hand king? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I assumed you meant handling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's hand um, king? <laughs> yeah, so you could you could imagine like that that console IO retry pot that console IO handler, um, you know, caching the the caching heavily the the res the returned um, results and keeping a, like a key value pair of you know URIs to to outputs and then running for a long time, right? Um, in the case, some people, there was a guy, I remember one of the guys I talked to, in fact, he did that exact thing. He was trying to even avoid the DNS. He, he was trying to even avoid the like, you know, F5 networking like uh, appliances on his racks, right? Like if possible, he wanted to go directly from his, where his app was to the thing that he was talking to via like IP address as fast as possible. Mm. Yeah, eliminate any D the DNS lookups, right? I mean, okay, you're you're paying what a, a couple milliseconds, right? 10, 20 milliseconds just for the DNS lookup. So yeah, like so you maybe so that's 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 a reason why some people prefer that client-based service discovery instead of using DNS, even though DNS is super convenient. Yeah. Oh yeah. Real easy to maintain and abstract and push it off somewhere else. Yeah. So Fritz.handking, new library for all things handy. I think that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, service discovery is hard. Yeah, but well, we had that baked into WCF. Thanks, uh, thanks for look, for watching uh, Vortex. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. So nice size crowd today. I like it. And uh, yeah, I see a couple folks tweeting about about today's little chat we're having. This is great. All right. Yeah. I mean, the same, presumably a very similar chat will be happening in an hour. It'll be great. It'll be all HTTP client all day. All day. That's all, all you need. You right? We're going to get, uh, yeah. we're going to drown Galloway and HTTP client. <laughs> so. Yeah. So this is the thing that's been sitting closest to mind for 2.1 for me because it's the thing that I worked on the most. Um, but yeah, if you so, get me back, I'm sure we could talk about other things. Sure. So 
let, I just want to take a peek over here at right what we were seeing in the command here. You know, if I wanted to try and if I wanted to get this nailed down here, looks like I'm I'm just having a slight problem here with my version not lining up right. Is this just yeah. is this just the nightly isn't configured properly or? Um, I suspect it's some like package like not like package feed non not being complete kind of problem, right? Okay. You get this problem, you're using dev branches or feeds, right? So you get you can get these problems where it's not complete, like the graph is not complete. Isn't there a so. command on .NET restore to say, to kind of force the download? Yeah. Force it to be resolved, no matter, even... Just to make sure that there's nothing cached sitting here locally. You know, go get it anyway. Just to double check. See, that looks like it worked. So is it going to choke? And so the, the last usage pattern that um, we talk about from time to time in this is um, using something like Refit, if any of you are familiar with Refit. So what's Refit? Uh, I'm not familiar with that. If you go to GitHub and search for Refit, um, Paul Betts' Refit. Oh, okay. Um, right. Then um, what it does is it generates a it generates a client for a REST API is the intent. So that's kind of like Swagger, isn't it? And, and Swashbuckle. Uh, no, I mean, it generates C-sharp code that can talk to the API. Yeah, I thought Swashbuckle time. would generate that for you. Yeah, sorry, yeah, for, for with Swashbuckle, yes, not, not Swagger. Um, not, not, right. not, not the document format, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, so you define an interface. The difference here is you define an interface, like his example here is I GitHub API, right? Mm. You just make the interface with the method that you care about, and then you say give me one of those and then at build time they generate this thing for you yeah we're exactly talking about retrofit um um don't stress cool um yeah okay. auto rest like there are many things that do this type of thing the refit is just the one i happen to choose as it's as the example today um so you could use refit with http client factory today by um Using basically when you when you configure refit, you can give it a HTTP client instance that it will use instead of the one that they knew up themselves and manage themselves. Mm. Um, so you just give it the one that you get from HTTP client factory, or you tell them to go create call HTTP client factory dot create because of they because their extensibility worked nicely. Um, but yeah, so there would potentially be a future where you could imagine HTTP client factory being behind something like this where. It's giving it's it's the thing that's handing out the HTTP clients for these things. And this is just receiving the client from the factory and then doing all the appropriate interactions that you want. Yeah. Okay. Every fit's kind of cool. So um, yeah, and there's also a world like talking about Swashbuckle and Swagger. Um, I don't know how we're getting whether I don't know what our time frames for this stuff is, but there's also a you know a desire to have. Um, ASP.NET and Web API and such to generate better. Um, open API docs by default, um, and potentially mm. have things like you know the um, the Swagger UI be the default UI when you F5 a Web API, for example, things like that. Gotcha. Um, well, Swagger and Open API, those are two different things, right? Open API is the is the name of the officialized Swagger document format. Gotcha. I remember seeing yeah. Daryl talking about, oh, we don't like Swagger too much here. Oh yeah, yeah. What is Swagger yeah. API? What is Open API banking? The Open API specification. Yeah, originally known as Swagger. Yeah, Open API is just the name of the spec now. Okay, so they've they've um, more standardized yeah, that's, it. That's that's more of a. I guess what I'm. I guess more what I was saying is, um, the yeah Swagger was renamed. Okay. Um. So the um. So the more what I was getting at is um. There's probably a future where we, you know, have an object model that represents. Because, like, if you think about what you want to do if you're, when you're generating this type of documentation for your app, well, you want some sort of object model that represents your API um, mm. independently of the output serialized format and then something that can serialize it to Swagger, right? Sure. Um, so we should, ideally, at some point in the future, we'll get better at making our stuff do that out of the box. Right. We don't have care about the thing. transport format. We just care about working on the endpoints. Yeah. So I don't know what. Um, yeah, I don't know when or if we'll get to that. But there's a desire. There's a desire to do stuff like that. Cool. 
I've used Message Handler with Retire to establish communication between microservices, and then it became obvious that post put messages should have correlation ID, otherwise it may end up having duplicated entries like order or something else. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, in order, in order to avoid that type of problem. Yeah, totally. Um, right, this is, there, this is the idempotent problem. You want to make sure that you're not running the same operation twice. Potentially, yeah. Um, if you are in a situation where you may get a failure, this is absolutely true of retry policies in general. If you're in a situation where you can get an exception back or you can have a failure of a request, and that, but that request may have still worked or done something on the other end, then you are not idempotent, and as such, it is not necessarily safe to um, to rerun, ju to just retry blindly. Yeah. Um, SQL Azure used to have this problem badly back in the day, um, because it didn't. But and they've they implemented a whole bunch of stuff to try and to try and make it better. But in general, yeah, that can be true. Um, there is some stuff. I don't, I'm not sure how this plays into this. Um, mm -hmm. This is mostly a diagnostics feature. Um, there is a correlation ID um, stamped automatically for a request. Uh, there's a type called activity that we added to CoreFX. It really? was mostly meant for diagnostics. Um, and every time you make an outgoing HTTP call using the default HTTP handler, um, it will stamp a correlation ID onto the outgoing request in a header so that at the other end you have that ID. So if I reach into my... It's not, not, not designed for fixing the problem that we're talking about here with retries. It was designed for distributed tracing. Sure. So would I be able to say... Right, and there's a correlation ID that, that is popped on here? Where? What are you talking about? So I've done oh, a, a... You, don't, you, don't, you don't see it. It's completely transparent to you. Okay. Um, it's but if it's you get a, internal. Yeah, but if you make a... If you make an, a HTTP request using a HTTP client, even in 2.0, um, you should see the correlation ID header on the request. Gotcha. All right, so if we did that, right, um, we're going to get a... What comes back off of this? A response message. And we would see it on that so, message. Yeah, you would see it on the... Well, you would see it on the request. Like if you were on the other end watching the client, oh. the request, and you would see the header. So the... The um, well, the way that you can see this in action is if you ever watched any of the um, app map application map demos in uh, Azure App Service, have you seen these in Diagnostics? Yeah, not, not App Service in app in yeah, but the app the application map, the Azure application map, um, it uses this stuff to show you those like just traces through your application where it's, it has like a box for your web app and a box for your backend API and a box for SQL. And then it shows you the line connecting them all and shows you the messages and stuff flowing through. Yeah. Um, you can, you can, this is this, this sort of stuff to that. Yeah. Application, yeah, application. Yep. Um, uh, Scott Hunter yeah. likes to show that demo a lot. Yeah. It's a cool demo. Yeah. Application sites has got a bunch of really cool features. Um, so I would see it on my on my request header here inside of my handler where I'm now intercepting that uh, async. You wouldn't. The reason you would... Uh, would you? No, you would not. And I think the reason that you would not is because it's implemented in the HTTP handler that happens next. Oh, so it would be in this send. Yeah, the activity would exist, but it wouldn't have, um, it wouldn't have done any stamping onto a request yet. So if I inspected it after this... You may see it then. Uh, Right, if yeah. I was here and looked at the headers down here, I would see it. Not, not that I would want to do anything. Um, yeah. And so yeah. there, there's, a, there's the type. It's called, uh, it's called activity. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at the, and actually, I think we're stamping that in. I thought we were stamping that in. Regular system web ASP. So sy system, yeah. I mean, which they made a bunch of changes all over the place to try and make this um, as nice as possible. But if you go to the CoreFX um, repo, so uh, .NET slash CoreFX, and then do T and go to uh, the activity.cs, you can see the type that keeps track of the data. And search for. Come here. 
It's still loading. Activity. It's fairly this is, and it's it's fairly it similar to the um, to the Zipkin kind of view of distributed tracing. If anybody's used that, I have yeah, not. the top one. There we go. So activity, operation name, ID. Yeah. So this thing based this thing exists. We make one of these for every um, inside an ASP.NET Core application. As a request comes in, a new one of these is made and it's put on a. Effectively, it has a thread local. I like this baggage. Um, yeah, so what baggage is, is you could have, you could put headers onto your request that then become baggage, which flow through the entire chain, right? And they become baggage that this request chain has to carry for everyone. Everyone has to carry. Okay. Um, which is, that's the terminology that uh, I think Zipkin and stuff use that we, that we maintained because it's the same purpose. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, every ASP.NET call request has one of these kind of going, I guess, and we stamp the um, request, the ID, onto the outgoing request. And then if the, if the other end of the request then also reads and reasons about that same flag, like if, if it's another ASP.NET Core app on the other end, for example, yeah. it'll take that ID and then prefix the end of it so you have this kind of growing, growing identifier, I believe mm. is the way it works. And then you're able um, to see and map everything that it went through. Yeah, and you can, then you can see this. And then, yeah, if you're logging this all the time, um, in this case, this is part of the system, system diagnostics and it goes to the places like Application Insights, then, yeah, you could take one of the identifiers and from that identifier show trace the request or through all of your .NET apps. Um, the, and then I think that's why the default error page now for the ASP.NET Core apps shows this correlation ID at the bottom of it somewhere mm. so that... Um, to show people that they can maybe that maybe it'll get given to to, to your ops guy who can then go look at application insights and then go trace the thing. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, right. That's on the the normal error page. Is this adding the? Yep. Yeah. If you made a new web app, I think you'd be able to see it like a new instead of a new empty. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see the dependencies, the thing, things like SQL and blob storage and stuff are done, are implemented as well. Um, uh, but they, I believe, are done in a different way, not necessarily with the exact activity type. Maybe they are. I can't remember exactly anymore. It's been a while. But they were, they were implemented by via doing extra logging in, um, like in SQL client and in you know the storage APIs. Um, so yeah, I don't think this will work here. So, because you don't have, um, what I mean is the custom error page you get from a new web app. Right. I'm doing the developer this exception empty, page. This is, an, this is an empty template, right? Right. But it's already got the use developer exception page, right? Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, error, I mean, error dot like ASPX that you have in the app when you make a new app. Oh, the, one oh, the, one oh. the customers would see. You might be able to see it on the developer exception page. I'm not sure, but um, the one that I was talking about when we started this was um, was uh, the um, the actual user facing error page that you get in a in a new app. Yeah, yeah. So if I did .NET new, um, let's do MVC, and let's call this test MVC twenty one. Getting ready. And put, put, okay. Test MVC. So it would be in um, views. I think it's under, is it shared? Uh, there it is. Yeah, I think so. I don't really remember anymore. So I believe I'm the one that even sent the PR to add it, but I can't remember where it was. So there's the request ID. If model yeah. show request ID. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's about the end of our time. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks, thanks so much for joining me. No worries. Thanks for having me down. Hopefully, it was. Uh, hopefully, this was good for everybody. Yeah. We. Gosh, I feel like we covered. We covered a lot here. We saw a lot about how the the HTTP client factory is is going to speed things up, simplify things, and reduce resource utilization. 
if you're using that to communicate with other services. Um, I love that we're going to be able to drop poly in there in the future and be able to get some of that failure detection and handling. That's going to be really, really helpful when we're building distributed applications. Um, and these are available now, right? We can start testing these. Um, the nightlies aren't really fully supported, but it'll get you on the right path when we do release 2.1, right? Yeah, it should be possible for you to try out some nightlies if you follow the instructions theoretically. Yeah. And and 2.1 should be mostly backward compatible to 2.0. So if you have something 2.0, your upgrade to 2.1 shouldn't be terribly painful. Mm -hmm. Right, if you wanted to branch and do the upgrade in a, that other repository. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it is a it is a point release, not a it's not a new major, so it's supposed to be supposed to be done breaking. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's a show. All right. Thank you very much, Thanks, sir. everybody. And thank you everybody for tuning in. We'll uh, we'll catch you on Thursday. So, we'll see you then. Bye. See you later. <laughs> Thanks, Cryptrix. <laughs> All right.